Michael and Kit go up against an automotive assassin. Oh. But when he's caught without Kit, it could mean curtains. An all-new Knight Rider. Next. Production 58640, Custom Made Killer. This episode was written by Burton Armis and directed by Harvey Laidman. It originally aired on NBC Sunday night, 8 p.m. on January 6th, 1985. It was the 53rd episode to air, but the 57th to be produced. The synopsis reads as follows. Michael and Kit are asked to investigate the death of a fashion designer after the burnt-out shell of his car is found at the bottom of a cliff. So, notice the rigging on the front of the killer car. The uh, crew that put this together, obviously, in this episode, this killer car, with the flick of a button, can flip up a uh, guard in the front, a push guard, right, that covers the whole front of the car. And that's why these mounts are supposedly here. Um, Story-wise, the the guard is supposed to be underneath the car he presses a button and it flips up but in reality that's obviously not going to work so what you're seeing here in these early scenes are the mounts for the guard so all the transition scenes where in this episode where you see the car having the guard activated were all done by miniatures which we'll show you here in a second but in reality, what they did is they actually had this metal guard that they would slide onto these two receivers here to um, to attach it to the car. So that's what you're looking at right there. But here is the miniature model. And actually, if you compare the two, they did a pretty Sessoms did a pretty good job of uh, replicating the uh, the front of the car. What is this? A Plymouth Fury, I think. I don't really know. Um, but yeah, you can see the guard, how it kind of flips up like that, but that was all done by miniature work. And then the real car just had it pushed on onto those receivers. Okay. Yeah. And there you go. So that's what it looks like whenever it's on. Interestingly. Yeah. It looks like they'd even, they, they replicated even the, the, uh, Ram, um, pretty closely to the actual piece here. Right. Let's see one, two, three, four, five ribs. One, two, three, four, five. Yeah. They did a pretty good job. All right, moving on. Uh, and then you see, yet again, another miniature shot of this uh, Dotson going over the edge. You know, this whole sequence reminds me of uh, Merchants of Death, whenever Camilla Claremont is driving a Dotson and um, goes over the edge and then is killed. So I guess in the world of Knight Rider, if you're driving a Dotson, watch out for cliffs. All right, so then we move to Michael and Kit, and Michael, instead of paying attention where he's driving, he's watching a hockey game. Now, I thought it'd be really great. So, obviously, this was some kind of a broadcast hockey game, I think. I highly doubt that they filmed this scene specifically for this episode. Could be wrong, though, but I doubt it. So, my charge to you guys is, let's see if we can figure out at least what teams these are, if not what game this maybe is. I don't know. It's hard to tell. There's no names on any of the jerseys, right? But we do have the green, white, yellow um, of this team, and then the white, blue, yellow of this team. So put it down in the comments below. Let's see if we can figure out exactly what game this is. That'd be really cool. So then we move to the transition of Michael and Kit entering the semi. And if you notice, this is actually footage filmed for season one, Hearts of Stone. And the semi emblem, the, the chess piece emblem is smaller and it's, it's back further and further down than it is for the majority of the series so this only this one episode hearts of stone had this paint configuration on the trailer before they repainted it so we know that this footage was filmed for that episode because this is the old style uh, paint job for the semi all right and then we move forward this is kai wolf making his second appearance in the series um, he previously appeared in season one's give me liberty or give me death as one of the alternative 2000 racers and here he plays the Assassin Flood. 
Kit's doing his analysis of the uh, Dotson's skid marks before it creamed off the cliff. And we see this insert shot here. And this is obviously a Ferrari. Uh, reused insert footage from Season 3's Knights of the Fast Lane for the Gold Dagger DX, which was one of uh, George Barris's personally owned cars. All right, so then Michael gets back in. This is the hero car for Season 3 and 4. Um, hard to see here. There's no white wire. Sorry. Um, but we still see a lot of this adhesive. It's just a mess up here. It's, it's very, uh, messy the way they glued all this. So, um, and then you can see that the coat hook is upside down. All right. So now we see an insert shot of, uh, Michael and Kit trying to narrow down fashion designers in the area. And let's just take a look to see if there's any hidden um easter eggs in this information all right so we've got mca international obviously uh mca owned universe it was mca universal at the time that uh, knight riders filmed so that would definitely be an in joke lou wasserman i was the head of universal at the time so that's neat that he's in there uh, let's see we've got uh, bruce golan right here he was an associate producer on knight rider for seasons three and four on this episode and then if you look through, you can see some of the data, like MCA International keeps repeating. Um, and same Bruce Golan repeats a couple times. Here's, uh, look at this, Blowhard Incorporated, G. Larson, Glenn Larson. Um, Blow Guns Limited, Patio Furniture. Oh, I get Patio Furniture. That's clever. I never noticed that until I actually said it right now. Patio Furniture. What else? Anything else? Bobo Neal? No. Bob O'Neill, C.A. Miller, R. Moskowski, yeah, Harold Howard, Sniver Realty. So um, very clever, the the uh, information that they kind of hid right here in plain sight. Yeah, it continues to scroll. Oh, look at this. Yellow, <laughs> this is great. This might be my favorite Easter egg ever. Yellow River Publishing ip daily <laughs> talk about a juvenile um reference ip daily at the yellow river publishing that's fascinating um mimi o graphs mary sudan look at this international software iva big bum <laughs> oh this is great um i think that might be the end of the let's see it anymore i have a big bum Neil F. Richmond, IP Daily. Yeah, this is this is just gold right here. All right, so now Michael and Kit arrive at Deb Joe Fashions. Uh, we talked to director Harvey Laidman. He said the majority of the episode was shot on location at the famous Fashion Mart in downtown Los Angeles. It's the area where all the 1940s film noir pictures were made, the Bradbury Building. It was fun being in that venue, and they were so used to filming there that they completely ignored us. The Mart is a great place to visit in LA. This is at 117 East 9th Street. Still there today, although um, at, on Google Street View, it's under heavy construction, but Kit parked right about here, and then they walked up right in there. And then on this scene, we actually have uh, two different Knight Rider returning stars. So Custom Made Killer probably has the most returning guest stars of any Knight Rider episode, I think, right? We got Kai Wolf already. We've got Alan Oppenheimer, who in this uh, episode plays Joe Lewis, but he was in um, season one's Deadly Maneuvers. And then over here we have Jimmy Murphy, who plays Tom O'Malley. And um, he was, what was his character name? Pink in season one's No Big Thing. So actually all three of these uh, guest stars, these two plus Kai Wolf, all came from season one of Knight Rider, which is... Um, pretty neat and by the way tom o'malley right here and then the season finale night strike or not the season finale the uh close to the season finale the last produced episode for season three night strike also has a character named tom o'malley so apparently that slipped through normally they wouldn't name two characters the exact same thing especially so close together but uh yeah here they are returning for their both of their second and last appearances in the series so here's a I guess somewhat rare appearance of another third generation F body in Knight Rider that the Tom O'Malley drives this uh, 1984 base model Camaro. You know, normally the show seems to shy away from other cars that have a similar body style than Kit, except for uh, this episode here. 
And then here's the killer car getting ready to give chase. If you remember back when we when I showed you the first screenshot of this car, the um, brackets were chrome, and here they are black. And if you watch as this progresses, those black ones will switch back and forth between black and chrome. So I think they were probably chrome at one point, and then they painted them black again. Either that or it's two different cars, which is very possible, a stunt car and a hero car. See, here's what I mean. So there they are, black, and then you come here. And there they are, um, a natural chrome finish. So I point this out, the interior shot here, because when I first saw this Camaro in here, my first thought is, well, this was part of the train wreck, the same train wreck that gave Knight Rider the extra Trans Ams for the show, because we do know that train wreck included 1983 Camaros as well. However, based solely on this seatbelt guide right here, this car would be a 1984 model. I believe these see, this style seatbelt guide debuted in 1984. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure that is. So I think this is a base 1984 Camaro, which rules this out as being a train wreck car. So now we get to the sequence where Flood driving the killer car pushes Tom O'Malley onto the train tracks, and uh, that's the end of Tom O'Malley. So this whole scene here took place at the intersection of Chandler Avenue and North Pass Avenue in Burbank. And you can even see here the train tracks right here. We'll take a look at this. In the intervening years, th so right here, they are, they are sitting right here, okay, at this stop sign. In the intervening years... The train tracks are completely gone. In fact, they've been replaced with this bike trail right here that runs down the center between the two um, lanes of traffic. So um, while that's all changed, the houses in the background here are all the same as what you see in the episode. So that hasn't changed, but they did remove the, the uh, rail bed. And um, take a look at this. So now... Uh, uh, Tom O'Malley's getting pushed through the intersection and take a look under the uh, Camaro. We see a very familiar tow bar setup, right? For the camera car. So, um, just like, uh, probably the killer car and just like the night rider cars, they had a hero car and a stunt car. And, um, this is the same car that they were using a few, you know, a few shots ago, whenever I showed you the interior, when they were filming, uh, Tom O'Malley from the inside, they had a, a camera truck hooked up right here. But um, that's, a, a, I guess, a, a throwback to the way Kit looked back in Season 1 and Season 2 when you could see the uh, tow bar receivers right there. And then we move to uh, miniature shots, right, from Sesums and Slagle. And this is, the, this is their Sesums uh, train. In fact, this is the same train, I believe, that we've seen a couple other times in Knight Rider Custom Kit, um, uh, Knight in Shining Armor, and... Obviously, all this is model work here of it being blown up. And actually, if you look right here, Sesam, SS, JR, Sesams and Slagle, um, Jack Sesams. I forget what that R stands for, but that's what that SSJR is. All right, so now we move and we see the, the accident report. Actually, this is a good... So does this license plate match up with what the Camaro showed? 1HTZ275. Let's go back and take a look. No, look, 958OHF. All right, well, let's just go back even further, right? 44, four, that's hard to read, 445. Four, nope, so this is a completely made up license plate number, but that's all right. Not surprising when it comes to Knight Rider. All right, so now take a look at this. So now we're, we have the killer car and the, uh, the uh, disappearing paint job, which was a really cool practical effect, effect that they did. But take a look at this. Now the uh, receivers here are different. Remember how I showed you before, they were, there were brackets that mounted around this bumper. Now it looks like they have a cutout in the bumper with the, uh, the receiver just mounted to it. So um, I don't know why they kept changing it from different colors to different styles, but uh, obviously there was a need. All right, so what do we see here? Michael's tearing up the check from um, DG Grebs. And uh, unfortunately, this is the clearest view we get of it, but you don't see too much except the date, September, September 17th, 84. 
And when did this episode air? January 6th, 1985. All right, so now we have Michael talking to Kit via his comm link, and we get this excellent shot of Kit's voice modulator actually working in the hero car. We know that the hero car had some limited capabilities. We know that based on our uh, analysis of Night in Disgrace, we know the TV worked at one time, and um, in the Rotten Apples, we saw Kit's voice modulator working there, and here we see it working again, which is kind of cool, and we'll see it, I think, maybe one or two more times in the series of it working, but just a neat, um, different style, you know, they didn't do the, the default, uh, filming of the soundstage dash, they decided to do it here, which I thought was pretty neat, and it even somewhat matches up with, uh, you know, the, the lights of the voice modulator somewhat match up with, um, the, the audio you hear, which was kind of nice. This is the left-hand blind drive car in um, this scene. For those of you curious, the cars that they use in this episode, they use the um, Season 3 Hero car, the right-hand blind drive car, the hardtop stunt car, uh, T-top stunt car, uh, uh, actually two different T-tops. One was the tan A-pillared car, which we talked about before, and then another general purpose stunt car. We've got the left-hand blind drive car, which you see here, and then the season three insert car. And actually, if you look through the hatch right here, it's hard to see, but you can see the small stunt wheel, and this red dot here is actually the light for the line lock is being activated, so the um, stunt guy knows that the line lock is on. And then the killer car uh, hits these two cars, and we've got not Michael right here, and not Michael right here, and then not Michael right there either, dead. So, um, still the left-hand blind drive car, and in fact, you can see the hand right here, the shroud from the seat, and the hand right there pulling uh, to a stop. And then the killer car uh, takes off and leaves. And one thing I wanted to point out, one other difference in this car. So um, there was a, I don't know if you call it a track bar or whatever, but here, look at this. When it was red, you can see it. See this, there's a bar back here that was on this car at one point, and then in other scenes, it's not on there too. So whatever. All right, so now we move forward. It's after the commercial break, and now you can see we're, we have the hero car here, right? right? We've got the, all the lights and the pretty dash and all that fun stuff. So then uh, Michael gets in. And um, if you look very, very carefully, this was really neat. Look right down here. You see this right here? This is the scanner controller. And I think this is the only time in the series you actually see it and see it on. But pay attention to the scene and just focus your eyes right here and you will see a tiny little scanner going back and forth. And that was the, um, the uh, display on the inside, the indicator. So the driver knew how fast the scanner was going. You'll see this tiny little LED bar going back and forth. And right here, this is the cable that runs um, from the controller to the relay box under the hood and then ultimately to the scanner. All right, so now let's talk about Garin Berry, the photographer here. We talked to him um, a number of years ago and uh, he told us an interesting story. He says, I was the voice of the Alex 7000 computer for the Bionic Woman. One day Universal's casting director, Mark Malis, asked me if I would read the kit part for him. At that time, there was no talk of anyone else for the part, so I left thinking I'd gotten the job. How sad I was to learn that William Daniels, who was already working on St. Elsewhere, got it. Um, later, uh, Barry also said... Um, he thinks that William Daniels did a wonderful job with Kit, and he's met him at SAG meetings, but they never spoke about how they were both up for the same role. But we've heard of other people who were up for the role of Michael Knight and Bonnie and all that stuff, but um, Gurin Barry is the only other potential candidate for Kit's voice that we know of, which is kind of neat. All right, and I know I've said this a couple times in season three about how there was this mandate that anytime you saw Kit, his scanner was on, and how... There were these couple scenes in season three where you see it off, which is kind of rare. And then I ran across this scene. I'm like, well, geez, it's not becoming rare. It's like every single episode, there's a scene with Kit's scanner off. And I'm not talking about stock footage from like season one. I'm talking about footage filmed for that episode. But here it is again, the hero car with Kit's scanner off. And now we have Michael in the insert car. And there's clearly, if you watch the scene, there's clearly someone in the back seat here. There's someone's arm right there and you can see it moving. But, um, and then this is the outside scene. This was all filmed, I think, in Griffith Park, if I remember correctly. But take a look at this. What you're looking at here is the last time you will ever see this kit car working 
um, as a stock kit car, if that makes sense. So this car right here in a couple episodes will be the one that is gutted and thrown into the toxic waste pit in Junkyard Dog. And actually, if you even compare like fog light placement and scanner, you see how the scanner, see how the opening goes up right here and gets real narrow and comes back down. That's not a shadow. It was actually a defect in the bumper. Um, you can see that when they pull uh, this car out of the toxic waste pit and you can see the, the fog lights are all where they need to be. This was the manual transmission stunt car they had, the one that um, I think was kind of loathed on set. A lot of people didn't like the manual transmission stunt car. So um, this is one of its last hurrahs as a stock a stock kit car, if you will. Um, as you know, that car will be gutted and then for season four, it'll become the hydraulic transforming super pursuit car. But um, one last hurrah for this um, tan A-pillared manual transmission stunt car. So then Michael stops the killer car and what we have here is the right-hand blind drive car and you actually get a rare look at uh, the inside of it while you know during the actual filming of an episode so remember this was michael chavez original hero car the one that he built and now if we look at it there's no dash in here there's a shell on top and it's cut right here there's no gauges it's all been gutted as you can see he opens the door a little bit you do see the stock headlight switch but right here this is the um uh speedometer cable just hanging out there and we see these uh wires right here I think this might be the dimmer switch, factory dimmer switch. You can see all the wear on the steering wheel. So at this point, it's a full-on stunt car, and it was treated as such, unfortunately. All right, and then we have to pay tribute to the Hoff's hair in this episode. This, is, this episode is the closest the Hoff will get to a mullet in the series. Um, this is absolutely the longest it gets. Now, in the late 80s, after after a Knight Rider ended, Hasselhoff grew a fairly decent mullet along the lines of this, maybe a tiny bit longer, but this is the absolute longest his hair gets in the entire series. And he's going to uh, get into Kit. You hear the Kit, the door sound effect, but if you look through here, the door is already open before you hear the sound effect. <laughs> So with that, we have concluded our talk on Custom Made Killer. Not, you know, there, there are certainly better Knight Rider episodes. There's a few good sequences in this. But next up, we are talking about Night by a Nose. And we have a very special supplemental interview with one of the guest stars from that episode that we're going to incorporate into our episode. So hope you enjoy it. Make sure you stay tuned for that. If you're not subscribed already, please do so. Thanks. We'll catch you next time. And now, while we listen to Joe's selection of Knight Rider music that we received directly from Don Peak himself, we'd like to thank these Patreon supporters. Look at you guys scrolling up the screen to my right. Wait a minute, how can you tell which side is my right since you can't see me because I'm not on camera? Oh well, you know what I mean. We're featuring these fine supporters at our Knight Rider prop restorer level. Thank you very much for your support. And for those of you at the Knight Rider History Hunter level, we're recognizing you right now in the description. Now, if you enjoyed seeing this golden nugget of Knight Rider history being rescued from obscurity, then please consider supporting us on Patreon. Your support would empower us to bring you even more of these historical nuggets. We are the Knight Rider Historians. Till next time, take care, everybody. Bye-bye.